What up, Gripsters and random YouTubers? Evan here for Gripst.com. And today we're beginning a series called The Best Session I Ever Played. The inspiration for this series came from wanting a boost of motivation to get my mind back into grind mode as summer comes to an end and school gets back in session. There's no better way to get yourself excited about poker than to remember a time that you were playing way above the rail. Incorporating every bit of information into your decision making, completely focused, totally in the flow, and making bank because of it. This tournament is from late 2014, when I was at the end of my stint living with Simon Charette, Griffin Benger, Greg Merson, and Calvin Anderson. I would learned a ton from them and decided that this session I wanted to see what I was capable of when I gave it my all and I did it on my own. So I decided to just play two tables that day and really pay attention to all the action. I traded in my music for my I Awake Focus tracks, which I played on repeat, and I did what I needed to do to get in the zone. I shut out the world, I shut out my play buddies, and I got to work. This tournament was a 215 euro buy-in with 152 runners. First place, just shy of 7,000 euros. So, let's go ahead and see what peak performance poker looks like in action. We start the tournament with a little pair of potatoes and get a fantastic flop drilling middle sizzle. This is a board that obviously we're going to be continuation betting with uh, one high card and two low, board, low cards. So we go ahead and do that when we got the goods as well as when we don't. Uh, because it's a board that we're going to be continuation betting a lot, I expect my opponent low bowl to be floating this flop a lot in addition to calling when he has a good hand like a king. So for that reason, instead of firing a second barrel here when the board got draw heavy, I opted to check, as I would with all the hands I'm giving up with, and allow him to take a stab with you know all his floats as well as his, his king x hands. Um, at this point, I wanted to get the maximum value out of my potatoes, and I went for a very large check raise. Uh, I, I kind of figured that I probably got as much value as I'm going to get out of the floats because once I check call the turn, he's probably not going to follow through on the river. But if he does have a king, uh, especially a king jack, I want to be able to get the max. And in the cases where he has a draw that he decided to bet, I want to charge him the maximum. So that's why I went quite large with my check raise. He made the call and everything bricks off on the river. So we went ahead and went for value. I think checking to induce a bluff again is a little too fancy. Uh, and we just take that one down. I'm going to be going through the hands, every hand that I play, up until the point where I fold the hand. So if there's a hand that I may have opened were there to be no action, I would like you guys to see what action happened that led to me folding the hand. Uh, so here with 10s, I just defend. We're very deep stacked. The player is raising from early position, and I'm pretty sure this guy plays a little bit more on the snug side in the early stages. So I don't think there's any real point in... Uh, re-raising him and three-betting him. He's just going to continue with better hands than me and fold all the worst ones. Uh, we get a pretty whatever board where we're just going to check and fold to a continuation bet, which doesn't happen, and we turn ourselves basically the nuts. Uh, once he checks back on this flop, I think that he probably has some kind of showdown value. And if, if it's a queen, I think he's going to call any bet. And if it's a pair under the queen, I think he's just going to fold anyway. So I decide to bet the largest I can, going 120 into 130, he calls. At this point, I'm pretty confident that he has a queen and not a king, so I want to go big on the river, but not so big that he gets scared off. I opt to go with two-thirds pot, and he calls me with ace-queen. We take down you know, a reasonable size pot. Uh, in spots like this with garbage hands on the button, pre-ante, deep stack, there's really not that much need or reason to raise them. You want a hand that's going to have some flop ability when you're raising on the button at this stage of the tournament. There's obviously no value to going after the blinds and trying to steal them. So you want some hand that has some, some big hand potential. And a hand like 4-3 offsuit just doesn't really have that. Now in the later stages when there's more up for grabs and there's antis in play and just you know larger blinds, obviously we want to raise a lot more buttons. But at this stage of the game, it's, I just feel it's completely unnecessary. Hands like 6-9 suited, on the other hand, have a lot more potential, and I go with the 3x raise here to A, build a bigger pot, and B, put more pressure on my opponents, and discourage them from defending with you know a super wide range where it may be a little tough to read their hand, uh, because you know my hand's not all that special. I'm really just going in there as a semi-bluff, so 
might as well press a little more fold equity. Here with Ace Jack, uh, I definitely have a hand that is ahead of a lot of the hands that Ballas is going to open with on the button. So I just opt to flat and keep in his weaker aces and his weaker jacks and be able to, you know, catch catch C bets from him on boards that I hit and that he misses. Uh, he opts to check back, so we go for a value bet and he just gets out of the way. No harm, no foul. King Queen, we raise it up, and this board is one that is kind of kind of dangerous. Um, there are a lot of hands that can hit this board. That being said, you know, there are also a lot of hands that would defend to a small raise that, that didn't hit this board, like his weak aces, his small pairs, and some of the Broadway hands. Uh, so we do fire a C bet, but very much on the small side, a about 40% pot. And on the turn, things are getting a lot more dangerous, you know. Uh, he definitely can have a straight at this point. Uh, and if not, he probably has some sort of two pair hand. So with things getting this dangerous, I check back to give myself a chance to realize my equity. And that is exactly what we did with an ace on the river. And uh, we, we, ain't, we ain't afraid of no flush. We're going for that value. If he happens to have gone runner, runner, flush, you know, he'll get one extra bet out of us by us raising instead of us just calling. But, uh, you know, he, he ain't got none. He just, he, he just floating and folding. This next king, queen, we also go ahead and make the open successful steal and with these pocket queens we raise it up and facing a you know 2.2 x 3 bet we opt to take the worst option of misclicking and folding um, even though you know i was giving it my all sometimes we still make mistakes it still happens um, not a big deal i think uh going back both four betting and flatting are fine options i think this early in the game i probably just go with a flat but you know, I could be convinced otherwise. Jack-10 suited, pop in a quick three bet. And Jack-10 suited is a really good hand for semi-bluffing with. We saw earlier when I had ace-jack offsuit that I just flatted the late position open. Uh, whereas with Jack-10 suited, which, you know, technically on the hot and cold scale is a worse hand, uh, but in terms of flopability, it's a much stronger hand, I opted to go for the three bet because it has the ability to pick up so many draws and also because it's a hand that my opponents, you know, may not expect me to have when I when I three bet. So I'm basically just, you know, throwing a couple bluffs in there so they won't just always put me on super strong hands. But at the same time, you know, when they're trying to read my hand, they're probably going to give me credit for a good one. So Jack four suited here. I take my like infinite to one. And despite the fact that I bottom pair with a gut shot, I don't really have much interest in putting much action in this pot five ways. So as soon as someone else uh, breathes on the pot, I am out of there. King Jack, we uh, raise and take it from the old sit-out guy. Now his name is not sit-out. He is just legit not there. Uh, he either registered the tournament early and is showing up late for his Sunday, which a lot of you know regs do sometimes, or he is focusing on his Poker Stars tournament and forgot that there's a tournament going on on the micro gaming network. Here with Jack-10, we flopped a good bit of showdown value and just opted to check it down to the river where I did go for a bet. Um, because I just, I was really confident. Oh no, I didn't go for a bet. Uh, the first time I reviewed it, I thought I went for a bet there. Um, but I was kind of like, well, why would I bet there? Even if I think I have the best hand, I don't really know what worse can call. So I'm, I'm happy that actually what happened was we just checked it down. It's a great spot to defend, getting three and a half to one. Um, I only need to win this pot about between one and four and one and five times. So we go ahead and call, and, and this is, you know, an above average board for us where I'm definitely willing to, to call a bet. And that's exactly what we do on the turn and check, check on the river. We take it down. I think with his particular hand, it makes more sense to just continuation bet the flop. And, you know, obviously he can go hard when he hits his king and he can also fire it up, followed up with multiple barrels on a spade, an eight or a nine. Here with king five suited, not interested in building a pot out of position, although it's it's definitely another one of those hands that you can throw in your semi-bluff range. Not quite as strong as the Jack-10 suited, uh, especially being out of position, but you know, it's an all right one. Ace-Jack, I flat. I think I'm definitely ahead of some of the hands that he's opening, but not too many of them, honestly, when it's hijack versus cutoff. So just call in, looking to catch a good board. I did not catch a good board on this one. I have no interest in putting more chips in the pot because I already have 
one of the weakest hands that I'm going to have going into the flop. So it's not like I need to protect my position with that hand or, you know, like defend my range with that hand. Here with Queen Jack, it's, it's a fine open with the guy sitting out. I think it's close if he's not. And we flop top pair. This is a board that is good to see bet, certainly. Um, but I do know that in the moment I, I decided I want to check because I didn't want to risk getting check raised. I saw there was a diamond draw. I saw there was some straight draw potential. So I thought I may get check raised. And with, you know, top pair mediocre kicker, I didn't want to play that big a pot. And I thought at best, you know, I'm getting two bets, two streets of play. So I figured why not wait till the equities are a little more set in stone on the later streets to put that action in. So it gets checked through and I'm pretty confident I have the best hand. Board's getting a little more dry. Time to uh, charge them opponents, and nobody had nothing. Surprise, surprise. Any action with the 10-4? I mean, it's a good price, but it's a pretty bad hand. And obviously, uh, we're always getting a really good price from the big blind, and a lot of extremely good players advocate defending just about everything from the big blind. And... Once antis come into play, it's it's very hard to refute that approach um, because you, you see that even pre-ante, the odds you get are extremely good. Um, so it's generally worth taking flops. That being said, you don't have to get involved with completely garbage hands. You may be giving up like a smidgen of equity uh, by not playing the hand, but if you aren't confident in your post-flop play or you just you know don't really feel like you're a superstar post-flop. You don't need to take those super close spots pre-flop because you're likely to make a mistake post-flop. And, and part of getting that expectation pre-flop and realizing that equity is being able to play, you know, perfectly post-flop or, or extremely well after the flop. Here with threes, I opt to defend blind versus blind. And this is just not a good board for me. So it's very easy to fold to my opponent's continuation back. And onward we go. Little ace Dewey on the button, no dice, little 10 8 0. And I think we got a playable hand here. Oh, we sure do. A little 9 8 suited. Bam. Easy steal. Jack 5 off. And obviously, we, ha we would have had a lot more to talk about that hand if it happened to be Jack King off. But oh shit, we got them aces and we raise it up and take it down like a boss. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how you play the maces. You don't lose your stack with them. That's that's the secret. King Queen, same story. We raise and take, and it's it's an easy game. And like, don't you wish that every hand was like this, where you just raise and take it down? Because if, if you could literally get all your steals through, you could win the tournament. Tournaments would be a very simple game. You just slowly, steadily cruise your way to the final table. And I, I guess heads up, it would be a pretty painful, slow teeth pulling experience to just blind your opponent away with successful steals. But, you know, let's let's ignore the heads up part. But getting there, if you can successfully just choose your steals right, you can make it to the final table in tournaments. And that's why um, proper blind stealing strategy and awareness of, of the good opportunities to do so is so, so important. Because it's about getting the little things right to be successful in this game and especially in this format. So here with the five, seven, seven suited, this is definitely a spot where we could defend um, but um, like I was saying, that pre-ante, the odds aren't as good, which is why I opted to fold. But if I went back today and, and was in this spot again, I would definitely play this hand, whether it be with a call or be with a three bet. This is not a spot where I would be releasing my hand because, you know, we're getting three to one. We only need to win the pot 25% of the time. And our equity against all but bigger pairs is more than 25%. You know, they say against, against a, random, a random hand against a strong range can still expect to have like almost 30 percent so you know when you're getting better than two to one on a pre-flop proposition if you think you got the skills to know which boards to continue on because they're good for you and which boards to get away from because they're no good for you um, those are situations where you're going to want to be involved in the action and we got that jacking off so we are getting involved with wait maybe, maybe this guy's name is sit out sneaky Anyway, we get a decent flop for our hand with the over cards and the flush draw. Uh, once it goes check, check, we feel very confident semi-bluffing with our hand, and we take it down. Jack-8 suited, hit the boys with a little three-piece, and they're like, nah, uh we got it. And we say, okay, no problem. This is a really solid squeeze spot. You know, we're about 
40 and 50 big blinds deep and it's a really you know disguised sneaky kind of hand when you're looking for these squeezing opportunities more important than your hand is you know the players that you're up against are they playing a lot of pots are they flat a lot are they very likely to fold if you think that your steal is going to work often enough you know i'm risking about 700 here to win 1500 i need about a 50 percent success rate then the cards don't matter um, just any quality of hand you have is just a bonus and the better your hand is the bigger your bonus is um, so this was you know big enough little bonus opportunity with the suited two gapper that i felt fine going for it and anders poker was like uh-uh not gonna happen and uh as my boy jamie staples would say that's okay it's not about having your plays work every time it's about making plays that you expect to be working often enough to be making you chips and therefore making you dollars in the long run. And when I was going through my, my review of the hands, I did want to mention that this, this ace 10 under the gun is a disciplined fold and that even with antis where we want to widen our opening range a little bit, uh, when you're deep stacked, it's important to respect early position and the fact that you know these players have a lot of room to make a lot of play and just on a nine-handed table ace 10 offsuit is actually not expected to be the best hand that was dealt and that's why i went ahead and folded it uh, you know with with that action you think the ace 10 is probably good but we can't know that no one else got dealt anything we're just making our assumption based on the information we have that there are eight other unknown hands and against eight other unknown hands ace 10 offsuit is likely to be the underdog um, things obviously change when we're in later position, but we wasn't. We was in first position. 5-3 suited late position. Let's go. And this is an interesting spot because, you know, he about 2.5 X's are raised. And we're getting we're getting a decent price here. 2.7 to 1. Needing like 27% equity. So 5-3 suited definitely has that amount of equity, which is why people will say that you could definitely defend this hand. Uh, at this time, you know, I didn't feel super, super confident about the post-flop play against, you know, uh, whatever he has, like 25 big blind stacks. So I just opted to take the lower variance route of folding. Uh, if my cards were higher, I would peel because there are more boards that I can make, you know, top pair on. But with 5-3 suited, you're rarely making top pair. So you really need to know which boards are great for semi-bluffing where he doesn't connect with the board to want to get involved in that uh, situation. All right, ace queen suited. Um, we opt to, you know, just call against our boy Anders Poker. He's already four bet us once, so he's capable of four betting us light. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean we would be excited about it. No, we're, we're probably gonna flat the four bet. We don't want a three bet to five bet all our chips with ace queen suited for like 40 blinds against an early position opener. And that being said, even if he's capable of four bet bluffing, it doesn't mean that he's four bet bluffing this time. And against a, a strong four betting range, I mean, ace queen isn't killing it. It's doing okay. So we just flat, you know, we got, we got the clubs, we got the broccolis. There's a lot of different boards we can get that we like. This is one of those boards that we like. And facing the C bet, I think that the best play is to just call. But I, I knew that this was a really good opportunity for a bluff raise because it's a board that Anders is going to be C betting all the time. We know that Anders is a looser player, so he's going to have a lot of hands that didn't hit this board. And because there are these other players behind me, uh, my raise looks that much stronger and looks that much more honest. So I knew that if I didn't have a good hand, this is a pretty good opportunity to make a bluff raise, throwing out, you know, 1,000 to win 2,500. Um, but with my particular hand, uh, I think that flatting and allowing him to continue to bluff is a really attractive option. I guess in the moment, too, um, I thought he might think this was kind of bullshitty and be more likely to give me an extra bet with a pair between the queens and fives than he would if I just called and it looked pretty obvious like I have a queen or a slow plate set. Uh, but either way, he either had nothing or he saw through the ruse and we're on to the next ones. Nine ten suited, raise it up, and we get a get a pretty decent board for our hand, uh, middle pair and an open ender. So um, you know we're feeling good. This is a spot where 
we can go either way. We could definitely check back and take this hand to showdown. It's a hand that has a very, very decent chance of being the best one come showdown. And it's a hand that's fine to play for, you know, one bet, maybe two. Um, this is a board where we're also going to get played back at a decent amount. So if we do bet and get raised, we have to have a plan of action. Uh, and that's exactly what happened in this hand. I fired out, you know, a small bet that gave him a lot of room to make a play on me. And he hit me with the old check raise. So looking at his range, looking at all the possible hands he can have, if he has queen 10, I'm obviously in very bad shape. And if he has 10, seven, I still have seven outs to make a chop, but, but we're not looking to win, you know, our money back when we're gonna be potentially investing a lot of chips in the spot. Um, but you know, against a lot of his value hands, like even if he has bottom two pair or top pair great kicker, I have like 47% equity. I'm gonna win the pot like almost half the time. And even versus top two or a set, I still have 30%, um, which is which is an okay amount of equity. And of course, there's, there's always the possibility that he's just bluffing on this board because it's a board that is, you know, one that I'm not going to connect with that often if you look at the hands that I'm raising with. And he's getting a pretty good price here, risking 1000 to win 2200 So I just say, you know what, let's play for all of it. And he calls rather quickly. And, you know, you're thinking we probably need to improve. And actually, we don't need to improve at all. Um, so what, what he did here was he, he check raised because, you know, it was a good spot for him to, him to fold us out. We're going to be bet folding a good amount of hands. And then once, once I shoved on him, uh, he was getting about two to one, 3K to win uh, about 9K. And he felt that he had enough equity with his hand to do that. And I think under normal circumstances, I mean, it's close. It's close. If the overcard's good, he definitely has enough equity if he's going purely on his open ender, not quite, but almost. So this was actually one of the worst case scenarios for him because half his outs with the straight draw were dead, but he still had, what do you have, three kings and, and four queens. He still had seven outs, so he had a decent chance of winning, but not decent enough. And we, uh, we managed to ship that one. So now that we have a few more chips, uh, we go ahead and raise. Unlike the ace-10 from earlier, this ace-9, you know, we're in middle position. There are fewer players to get through, and we also have more chips. So we're happy to go ahead and steal and, and start investing in our image at this table as, you know, a more looser, aggressive player so that we'll be able to get more action later on. Uh, this ace-jack is, is interesting. If, if German baller's a tight player, despite the fact we're getting a decent price, I think folding is fine here, and that's what we opted to do. If he's a really loose player, you know, the ace jack is going to be slightly ahead of what he's opening, and then it's a matter of figuring out the best way to proceed. I just decided, you know, even if there is a little bit of value here, there's not enough that I feel compelled to get involved in the spot, and I opted to pass up on that uh, opportunity, if you want to call it an opportunity. Uh, Ace Jack's one of those trouble hands where you know you really got to pay attention to the situation and decide how much value is there because you know when when you're first dealt it it obviously looks good um, but then it really depends on the action ahead as to just how good it is. So we go ahead and make the semi bluff with the Ace Ten suited. In this spot, I'm taking control of the hand with another good semi bluffing hand, and I'm also paying a very small amount to take the initiative. You know, he's making it. 2x and I'm making it like 4. Point, what is that like 4.3x 4.375x uh, so I'm not investing that many chips to take the lead in the hand and if I get four bets you know the action just depends on the size if it's small I'm probably going to peel because ace 10 suited can hit hit a few solid flops but also you know if he, if he four bets big and I feel like I'm probably in bad shape, like I'm looking at a three outer. I'm never too disappointed about having to fold my hand uh, and getting forced off because if all I'm looking to do is either flop two pair or trip tens or a flush draw, then it's, it's pretty hard for me to, to, you know, win. Most of the time I'm just gonna miss and have to fold. Uh, so this way I'm finding out early and I'm finding out cheap kind of where he, he is in his range, how good of a hand that he has. And that way, you know, if the board were to come ace high, 
um, I'm not even getting to experience that opportunity as opposed to calling and then having to call down three streets because I feel like, you know, I flopped good enough, I got a call down. So I, there's, there's many really good benefits to making the small three bets with these, you know, strong semi-bluffing hands. And next up we get Ace-King, which we also go ahead and three bet for the exact same amount, and this time Bratelli four bets us. And based on what had happened the last hand that I just three bet, uh, I think this guy is newer to the table, and he's got some chips, so you know he's probably gonna have the four bet in his in his toolkit as well. Um, so I decide that I am not gonna fold this hand, but I want to give him the maximum opportunity to put it in with the worst hand. Like let's let's say he just decides to go crazy with Ace Four suited for some reason. If I shove here, he can't really call off with it. But if I five bet small. I give him the room to go ahead and do that. And that's what he does. And we call. I'm not saying that he's got ace four suited because he actually has pocket queens. But on this flop, we're feeling quite all right. And it, it is a lot of big blinds to get in with ace king. You know, that was about 60 big blinds. Uh, Cut off versus under the gun. But based on what had happened in the hand before, I felt there was a really good chance that this guy was four betting light. So, you know, I had to five bet, and once I have five bet, I'm not, I'm not folding the hand. So I, I felt that the five bet was a good play, and then I'm priced in to make the call. And that gives us a very big stack and a very good spot to uh, finish up this part. So that's going to wrap up part one of the series. I hope you found it insightful and informative. I'll see you back here for part two.